Of course, as always, my first request is please turn off your cell phones. Thank you. That makes me so happy. Well, today, because the point of this class was not to be so U.S. centric, we are going to talk about uh, events on uh, the other side of the world. Uh, we're going to talk about a class that I refer to as the darkest days. Uh, that's about Singapore, Burma, and the Dutch East Indies. So we're going to look at this. Again, the purposes, purpose of this class was to be more encompassing of this aspect of World War II. So with all that said, let's get started. Well, December 8th, of course, is December 7th on our side of the date line. So the Japanese have an incredibly ambitious plan. I, I would say it's pretty amazing, really. On the first day of the war, of course, they're going to raid Pearl Harbor, but they're also going to launch invasions of the Philippines, the Malay Peninsula, and the Kra Isthmus. They're going to, to invade Guam. They're going to attack uh, and invade Wake Island. They're going to take Hong Kong. They're going to take Shanghai. They're going to do all this stuff on the first day. This is incredibly uh, ambitious, in my opinion, because quite honestly, this is going to take every single resource they have in order to try to achieve these kind of things this quickly. So virtually everything the Japanese have available is going into these offensives uh, as far as logistics goes and their Navy. So that's the first piece today. Second piece is, well, where is the really the most important attack as far as they're concerned? And this is always to catch that southern resource area. They want those goodies that are available in Malaya and uh, in Java, oil, tin, rubber, all these things that they want that they feel will make them a great power. And the other piece to this, of course, is always this aspect of Pan-Asianism. In other words, they're going to not just capture the southern resource area, but they're going to create Asia for Asians. They're going to create a thing they call the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. Of course, what that means really is, is that the Asian nations will basically be under the benevolent rule. Benevolent, the father nation will, of course, be Japan. And this will, they will be in a Confucian manner, kind of like Japan's like children. So, but that's their, their plan. So they're going to have this Pan-Asianism. So on this map, you can see that I've marked off a place called Singapore. And you can see that Singapore is a quite a strategic location because it is at the tip of the uh, Strait of Malacca. And, of course, it dominates the ocean area of like by Borneo and Java. So that's a key piece there. Another one thing I did is I drew a red arrow. And that red arrow is indeed going to be the shipping route that all these goodies are going to need to be transported up to Japan. Well, if you'll notice, that arrow runs right past a thing called the Philippines. The Japanese automatically assume that we will try to cut that supply line. And indeed, we will go into the war and that that supply line will be vulnerable to U.S. air power, particularly on the island of Luzon. So that is one of the major reasons, if not the major reason, that the Japanese feel that they have to attack us on day one. So when we look at this, though, you can see how important Singapore is uh, to their overall plan. Well, we go back in history. Uh, the Japanese and the British actually have a very close relationship. Uh, that relationship uh, is their the Japanese reach out to the British in the Meiji Restoration and say, we really would like you to help us build a navy, and the British certainly do that. Uh, they build ships for the Japanese uh, up until World War I. And in 1902, they, they sign an agreement. It's a very, very close agreement between the British and the Japanese. And the Japanese also, of course, are going to be part of World War I on the British side. Well, during this time frame, there become to be some issues between the Japanese and the British. Uh, one of the first is going to be the uh, 21 demands that I have sent you an email about. And the 21 demands are done in 1915 during the war. So the, the Japanese early in the war have captured uh, all the 
German area of China, Tsingtao particularly, and then the Shandong Peninsula. They've captured uh, various islands that the Germans controlled. And Japanese now have decided that they're going to try to make China, because they're so disorganized, into a vassal state in 1915. The French and the British are like, mm, nah, they don't think this is such a great idea. And they do force the Japanese to back off on five of their 21 demands, the most harsh that would actually make China basically a, a, a puppet state to the Japanese. So, and this continues on into 1922 after the Treaty of Versailles, which the Chinese refused to sign because they have Japanese occupation. In, in 1922, there's a thing called the Four Power Agreement. And in the Four Power Agreement, uh, finally, the Japanese are willing to acknowledge that China is a state. And they are also at that point, that treaty that they created in 1902 is becomes null and void. So we see now that the British are starting to back away pretty much aggressively from the Japanese because, of course, they see the Japanese as a threat to their power in China, particularly. So they don't want the Japanese to be controlling the Pacific. So they start to think that maybe we need to not be so close to these guys. And indeed, uh, they make a plan to do that. And that's going to be, is they're going to build a major fleet base. They don't have a big base in East Asia. And they decide that they're going to build this base at the island of Singapore, which is at the tip of the Malay Peninsula. And they're going to pour a lot of money into this thing. Uh, for example, if you look at this picture, that's a graving dock, or we would call it a dry dock. And you can see the Queen Mary is in there. So they built a dock that's capable of taking an 80,000 ton ship. There's no battleship in the world nearly that large. So you can see that they're preparing for the future here to make this base something that they're going to keep for uh, the foreseeable future at best. So they're going to pour more and more and more money into this area to to try to maintain this their strategic balance in the in the Pacific. But what really kind of happens here is, of course, after World War I, they don't really have enough money to complete this base. But the idea of the base is, again, to have a place where you can have a whole fleet, and if the fleet gets damaged, you have the ability to repair it. So it's a major expense on the British part. Well, the strategy is simply this, that in the event of war with Japan, what they're going to do is they're going to move their entire British fleet to Singapore. There's going, then going to be a bunch of major naval battles. Uh, hopefully they will uh, defeat the Japanese, and then they will blockade the Japanese home islands. Once they blockade the Japanese home islands, the assumption is, of course, the Japanese will have to surrender. There is never, ever a plan for them to actually invade Japan. It's strictly going to be a naval naval war. Well, so... Uh, the assumption also is, is that the British fleet is going to be able to achieve this in only 30 days. So their plan is to move the entire bulk of the British fleet all the way to Singapore in 30 days. And the way they're going to do that is they start to build island bases that can refuel their ships on this route, because that's a long way away, especially in the 1920s and 30s. So that is the idea of the basic Singapore strategy, that their entire fleet will move and defeat the Japanese. Well, something gets in the way of that thinking, and that is the fact that now that the British are fighting the Germans and the Italians. So they have to tie up a large portion of their fleet uh, to, to maintain a watch over the North Sea for the Germans. And of course, the Italians have a very large fleet in the Mediterranean. And so there's a problem. They don't really have this capability to send that fleet. And also the other problem is, is they're going to have to need some more ground troops in uh, the Malay Peninsula as well. So they don't have the capability now to do what they need to do to finish this space and to prepare it properly. Another thing crops up in June of 1941, and that's simply that they're going to be, the Russians are now in the war. So armaments that they had planned to send to Singapore are now given in a lend-lease manner to Russia. 
So that's another issue with what they have to defend this island with. It gets it gets worse and worse. If you actually look at uh, the Kharkov offensive by the Russians in uh, spring of 1942, you'd be surprised at how many British tanks are involved in that and how many British aircraft are involved in that. So they are supplying Russia with a significant portion of equipment, but at the expense, of course, of Singapore. Well, we've seen about the Japanese have taken uh, southern Indochina, which is right by Malaya. And uh, the British are incredibly concerned about this because this is very close to Singapore. And Churchill makes a decision that he doesn't have the fleet capability to send to Singapore, but he is going to send a raiding force. And that raiding force is going to include the battleship Prince of Wales, the battle cruiser Repulse, and the brand new aircraft carrier Illustrious. Just as a little piece of information, a battle cruiser is the size of a battleship. It has the same guns as a battleship, but it's much faster, but it has a lot less armor. I think probably if I say battleships when I'm referring to these two, at least you'll understand the difference between those two types of warships. But that's where they're at. So Churchill's going to send a raiding force. Well, also a thing comes to mind is that Singapore, even though it's an island, it's really, really close to the Malay Peninsula. And the thought process is, well, what if the Japanese land up on the Malay Peninsula and the Krai Isthmus and start to move down? We need to have a force to defend the Malay Peninsula. Otherwise, Singapore is not going to be a viable base. And so, indeed, they start to do this. And what are they going to do is they're going to send the 3rd Indian Corps. The 3rd Indian Corps is not particularly well-trained. It is not particularly well armed and it's not particularly well motivated. They're also going to send a strong contingent of British troops. They are not going to be able to spare any tanks for this. So they've got this infantry force that's trained in a Western manner on this island of uh, actually the peninsula of Malaya. Well, None of these forces are really particularly good. They're going to do another thing, though, right at the right at the end, because, again, they're feeling the pressure of those Japanese, and they're going to send the brand-new 8th Australian Division. The 8th Australian Division is known as an AIF unit, an Australian Imperial Force. This is an equivalent of their regular army. Three of these divisions are already fighting in North Africa against the Germans. This unit is supposed to go join them in North Africa. It is diverted primarily to Singapore, but part of it goes to Rabaul, part of it goes to Timor, part of it goes to the Dutch East Indies also. So this division is not an entire division. It's a really strong, well-trained unit and well-armed, should be a great fighting force, but it's been dispersed a bit. The bulk of it does go, in fact, to uh, Singapore, but again, it's not at full strength. So, I'm sorry? Totally for the entire battle, the Australians will come to about 14,000, I believe. Uh, but that's for the entire time. But uh, they do send a regiment, a regiment, I think? Yeah, I think they send a regiment, a whole regiment to uh, Rabaul, for example. So, Again, it's not, in, its integrity is broken up. Well, the big other piece is going to be air power. With the British fleet tied up, the Australians particularly say, well, you know what? We need to defend this area with a lot more air power. And they're going to ask the British for 500 frontline aircraft. Well, unfortunately, the British don't have 500 frontline aircraft to spare. What they are going to send is they're going to send 250 aircraft. Perhaps 160 of those are front line. Perhaps. They're going to be faced by 500 Japanese aircraft that are front line, and are, quite a few of them are piloted by veterans from the war in China. So you're going to have a relatively inexperienced units flying inferior aircraft against these Japanese pilots. And we can see here... The primary torpedo bomber that the British send is the Wildebeest. And I, I believe if you look at this picture, you'll think that the Kate that attacked Pearl Harbor last week 
was probably a little bit more modern aircraft than this biplane. And uh, it, it's, of course, it's slow and it's vulnerable. So that's what they've got for torpedo bombers. Well, uh, the standard history would always tell you that, uh, you know, the British had disdain for the Japanese pilots, that, no, they weren't any good and their aircraft weren't any good and, and that there wasn't a worry here. You know, whatever we send will be good enough to take the Japanese on. Documents actually came out in the 1990s that really don't back that up. It, it seems that the British were much more aware of the capabilities of the Japanese because they'd seen them in China for the previous four years. So it's that whole attitude, well, they had a bad, you know, they were just dismissed the Japanese. Not necessarily true. But remember now I said that they're scraping up everything they can get to send here. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to buy aircraft from other countries, primarily the United States. And what they decide is good enough to fight the Japanese is going to be this aircraft. It's the Brewster Buffalo. Many people feel that this is perhaps the worst fighter plane of World War II. It does look a bit to me like a, a flying beer barrel, but, but it, it, the problem isn't so much that. Actually, in 1938 and 39, the U.S. Navy decides to buy this aircraft over the F-4F Wildcat. And it's not a bad airplane when it's in its original configuration. But what is going to happen here is simply this, is that, well, you know, we really need self-sealing fuel tanks. So they put those on. That adds weight. We really need pilot armor. Well, that adds weight. We need armored windshields. We need this and that and all this other stuff. And the plane becomes heavier and heavier and heavier. Well, the British aren't even buying this plane. The British are buying the export version of this plane. This plane has a 1,200 horsepower engine. Those are in short supply because we need them for our planes. So what are they going to do? They're going to substitute a 1,000 horsepower engine. And some of those 1,000 horsepower engines are actually taken off of DC-3s and rebuilt to this new 1,000 horsepower standard. So they're not even necessarily new engines. So we see more and more and more problems with this aircraft. But perhaps the biggest problem is, this is probably one of the biggest scandals in the defense industry in U.S. history, is the Brewster Aircraft Company itself. The Brewster Aircraft Company is incredibly mismanaged. Uh, it's so mismanaged that, indeed, two of its uh, uh, leaders are sent to prison. Uh, the plane itself, the factory workers are so unhappy that they believe that there was actually sabotage going on building these aircraft. Uh, they're well known to leak oil and spray it all over the windshield, for example. They have really bad high-altitude capabilities. So they're just not only bad planes with bad problems, but they are badly built. So badly built that by 1943, the United States government takes over the Brewster Aircraft Company, gets rid of all their management, and it becomes part, basically a part of the U.S. government. So we see that this was good enough to fight the Japanese. Unfortunately, the Japanese Oscars and the Zeros uh, are vastly superior aircraft to this guy. So, oh well. In the U.S. government over Brewster. Yes. What did they do with it? Oh, they ran it. They continued to make uh, 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 Corsairs. Oh, okay. oh. They stopped. The, there was only two aircraft made by Brewster that were part of World War II. One, of course, was the Buffalo, and the other one was an incredibly bad aircraft called the Buccaneer. Yeah. The Buccaneer is a terrible aircraft, so bad that it never saw combat, even though I think they built about 800 of them. So they were basically used as training aircraft and target toes. No, Brewster's a terrible one. Yeah, they're terrible. They're they're awful. Well, anyway, let's talk about this guy, right? Tomoyuki Yamashita. I think that Yamashita, personally think, is that he is the greatest general produced by the Japanese in World War II. Yamashita, I think, was, I, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say brilliant, but he knew how to fight a battle. And 
He's going to be in charge of this attack. He's got two divisions plus a thing called the Imperial Guards. He's got the 15th and 18th. Those are both combat uh, trained veteran divisions coming out of China. The 18th is trained for naval landing or you know beach landings. And he also has the Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard is not a combat unit. They've never been in combat. But they are the Imperial Guard. They've got incredibly high morale, and they have the absolute best equipment that the Japanese can give them. So they're a, very much an elite unit. Well, Yamashita's got 70,000 men. He's got 200 tanks. And for the Japanese, that's an incredibly large number of tanks. They normally wouldn't have anywhere near that number. But he's given that as a, as a you know, because this is a really important attack. He thinks he's going to face maybe 30, 50,000 British and Indian troops. Unfortunately, he doesn't realize that he's going to be facing 80,000 troops. So he's going to attack with 70,000 troops against 80,000. Now, anybody that uh, is particularly plays war games would know that you always want to have an attack of two to one. All right. Well, he's going to actually attack with an inferior force down the Malay Peninsula. So it's a really, I would say it seems iffy to me. The other thing is, is he's got a really problem with logistics. Remember, the Japanese are attacking all over the Philippines, Thailand, everywhere. They don't have the logistics capability to support this thing, really. So, <laughs> excuse me. So they're stretched really thin. So he knows he's got to win quick. And he also knows that he's not going to get a lot more troops, and he's certainly not going to get a lot more logistics. He has to win with what he has, and he does. <laughs> so uh, they have a huge advantage, though, too, and that's going to be with this guy, Fujiwara. So they are really looking at finding independence movements in these countries they're invading. Because quite honestly, a lot of these people don't like British and Dutch rule. So they create a unit called F. Kikan. And F. Kikan is an intelligence unit that spends its time trying to bolster support from local indigenous groups that want to overthrow colonial rule. And so they reach out to a melee group. They're kind of socialists, actually. but And the Japanese don't like communists at all. But... They're willing to work with these guys because this is to their advantage. They reach out to a group in Malay Peninsula that is Indian expatriates. These Indian expatriates want British rule overthrowed in India. So they support these groups. They give them cash. They tell them, you know, we're going to help you create the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. And certainly they begin to support the Japanese quite aggressively. So what are they going to do? They're going to give the Japanese intelligence. They're going to give the Japanese maps. They're actually going to lead Japanese troops so Japanese troops don't get lost and, and can find their way through the jungle, etc. So these people play an incredibly important role in Japanese success in these attacks, as we'll see, not just in Malaya. Well, there's other issues, too. The Japanese have found a few... British traders. They pay these people. They're unhappy. They want some cash. And probably the most famous is a gentleman named Cap Captain Patrick Heenan. Uh, he meets a very unsavory end. So what I'm going to do with this, rather than go into great detail for time-wise, I will send you a, a link to Wikipedia about Captain Heenan. So <laughs> it's it's uh, he's, he's not the brightest uh, bulb let's put it that way so anyway this is a huge advantage for the japanese because they have indigenous people that are going to support them yes jim or the attack on pearl harbor did they have this intelligence work in those couple years a okay. couple years in advance they started prepping so uh it was not unusual for uh, you know it's a fifth column is what the normal term would be so all right, so on December 4th, I talked about this a little bit last week, but we'll go in a little more detail. There's going to be the invasion force. It's leaving from uh, Hainan Island in by the Chinese coast. 
and it's going to meet up with another unit coming out of Saigon area. They're going to meet in the middle of the uh, ocean there. You can see the two black lines, and then they're going to meet up, and they're going to be this red line heading for Malay Peninsula and the Kra Ifas. So that's what happens, uh, how this starts. Well, the Royal Australian Air Force, of course, has reconnaissance aircraft. The Hudson spots this convoy. It radios in, and they reach out to Admiral Phillips. Admiral Phillips is in charge of the naval units at Singapore and in charge of that raiding force. And he's actually meeting with his U.S. counterpart in the Philippines in Manila with Admiral Hart. And he gets this information. And he immediately is going to rush back to the United States, or excuse me, back to Singapore but he tells the United States this is going on. So now the United States is aware that there is a convoy headed for a Malaya of Japanese invaders. And I think that's the piece when I was talking last week about Pearl Harbor, about how we were so convinced that the Japanese were not going to attack Pearl Harbor, were in fact going to go to Malaya. And they all gave the boys the night off uh, because the war was going to start in a day or two. That's the convoy I was talking about. So... What happens then is he flies back to Singapore. The battle cruiser uh, Repulse is actually on its way to Australia. That's recalled, and and they start to prepare for the war. So, unfortunately, the next day, the uh, uh, RAF Catalina goes to find this uh, same piece, the same convoy. And it's shot down. And those people become the first casualties of this part of World War II. Is actually RAF uh, unit before a day before Pearl Harbor. They're actually going to be the first casualties, these eight guys. So, again, you can see what's going on here. And let's start a little bit closer picture. If you look here at the bottom, very bottom right corner, you can see Singapore. You can see the Strait of Malacca. Japanese are going to land at three points. They're going to land at Singora and Patani. Those are both in Siam at the time. We would call it Thailand. They're also going to land in Malaya at a place called Kota Baru. That's the top three. I marked for just for reference in a future slide the town of Kuantan and the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. You can see that in the, on the, all the way on the right there. So just keep that in mind for another slide. So just kind of save a little time here. So we see that those are the three main landing points. Well, the British have a plan because those, the two landing points, Patani and uh, Singora have really good harbors. And those are gonna be the primary place the Japanese want to take. And what they're going to do is they're going to try to do a thing called Matador, Operation Matador. And they want really the, to basically break uh, sovereignty of Siam. So they want to rush an Indian division up to these two cities and occupy them before the Japanese can land. That's their plan. The British government, all of a sudden, they see the convoys coming. And they said, okay, we need to do Operation Matador. And the British uh, government says, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're not going to break the sovereignty of Thailand or S Siam uh, because that would then the Japanese, when they land, they could say they're there to free Siam from our uh, invasion. Probably a really bad plan. Probably really should have uh, done Operation Matador and put up a much better, stiffer resistance to the Japanese because the Japanese really need those two ports. So... They do a delayed version of, uh, you know, this. But so the Japanese land and the Thais put up token resistance, about two hours worth of, of resistance. And the, really, I think there was some hanky-panky going on between the Japanese and the, and the Siamese governments at this time. Because you'll see this when they go into Burma, how rapidly the, the Thais uh, acquiesce to, to Japanese behavior. So the Japanese basically have got these two ports right away. The 11th Division of the Indian Army tries to get into Thailand 
and to oppose the Japanese. And there's Thai border guards. The, 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 Jap, the Thai border guards managed to hold up an entire Indian division until the Japanese 15th division that has to embark and get on the road and get over to here to and actually kicks them out of uh, Thailand. Now, my feeling is, is if a, an entire division can't push border guards out of the way, how good is that division? And uh, really, I think they're, the Indian troops really are pretty terrible in this entire thing. The British are much better and the Australians aren't either, but some of these Indian troops are just pathetic, I would say. Uh, I'm not trying to denigrate them, but really border guards? I mean, come on. So, uh, well, there is an invasion in Malaya itself, and that's a Kota Baru. And Kota Baru is going to be attacked by that 18th Division that I said was trained for naval landing. And they're going to launch 5,200 men into this initial beach assault. Well, it's going to turn a little bit out, kind of like Omaha Beach in Normandy, because they're going up against barbed wire, pillboxes, mines on these beaches. And the whole first and second waves are pinned down on the beach by, by this Indian division. Uh, but what happens is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this soon, but the Japanese, there's a swamp. And the Indian troops don't defend the swamp. They think it's impenetrable. The Japanese sneak a unit through this swamp and get in behind these Indian troops. The Indian troops, whenever they get people behind them, they are, their tendency is to basically retreat. And indeed, that's what's going to happen. So now the Japanese have the capability to take this beach. Well, there's also a key airfield here. And that airfield has been launching British Hudsons, which have actually been relatively effective. They have sunk a Japanese transport. They've damaged two others. So we see that indeed, this piece is... Because this airfield is going rather well. But then what happens is the, the Indian troops and the British decide to abandon the airfield. And not only do they abandon the airfield, they don't destroy its fuel. They don't destroy its structure. And so the Japanese are going to begin to take this field over right away and use it really quickly. And this is going to have a huge effect, too, on attacks on Singapore. Well, Kota Baru is almost a success. They managed to cause 800 casualties to this 5,200 unit, 5,200 men that land from the Japanese. So the Japanese take significant losses. But once again, the we see that the Indian troops don't really complete the thing. They they are too easily, uh, basically, uh, to to retreat if they get cut off. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But so. That airfield is really important. But the Japanese actually have other airfields in Indochina that are able to use aircraft like this, the GM G4M Betty. Betty is a very long-range aircraft. It's a naval aircraft. It's not by the Japanese Army. Again, I talked about Pearl Harbor a little bit, that the Japanese are the only country at this time that creates medium bombers that have really good range that are capable of sinking ships with torpedoes. So they're they're pretty much ahead of the game in this regard. So they build a strong land-based air force. Well, it's a pretty capable aircraft, really. It's fast. Uh, it's got really long range. And again, it can sink ships, and they train to do that. These, these, these people are trained to come in really low, with a medium bomber and drop torpedoes. And, and they're quite effective, except uh, if they are opposed by enemy aircraft. And the whole plan of these aircraft was they were going to go be part of island bases and they would be unsinkable aircraft carriers. So when the US fleet moved across the Pacific to confront the Japanese by the Philippines, they would be whittled down. This was that whole plan. Well. Problems with Japanese aircraft are always the same. They don't have self-sealing fuel tanks. They're not particularly well armed. So the Japanese refer to this aircraft as the flying cigar because of its 
fuselage. We have another name for this aircraft. We call it the one-shot Ronson lighter because all it takes is one shot and this thing lights up. So as it has really, really large fuel tanks that are not self-sealing. So if the Betty is not opposed by a uh, cap, combat air patrols from like an aircraft carrier, et cetera, it's a really effective aircraft. If it is opposed <laughs> by, by good AA capability and by enemy fighters, it's not a good aircraft. So they're going to use this aircraft to great effect. So when we see, we talked about the raiding force. And the raiding force consisted of the battleship, the battle cruiser, and a carrier. Well, the carrier, like I said, is the illustrious, and it's a brand new carrier, and it's in the Caribbean being trained. It hits a coral head, and it damages its hull. And the decision is made that, well, we're just going to send the battleships without a carrier. Now, they're going to try to use the old, old carrier Hermes. But then the decision is made is the Hermes is too slow and too incapable, and it's just not worth sending it. So these two battleships, battle cruiser, they go to Singapore by themselves. No air support. Well, I told you about uh, Admiral Phillips. By the way, Admiral Phillips is a little bitty guy, and they call him Tom Thumb. Okay, his, his name is Tom Phillips. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so he decides that he's going to go take these two ships and four destroyers, and he's going to run up to uh, Kota Baru, and he's going to try to defeat the Japanese uh, landing. Well, by the time he gets to sea and starts heading up there, reconnaissance aircraft have said that they're already gone. Another key factor is, is he asked the RAF, can I have some air support? I need some air support for this, uh, in, uh, my units. And they say, we're sorry, we don't have anything to spare. And he thinks the decision, he goes, well, you know, no battleship has ever been sunk at sea and fully defended. The only battleships that have ever been sunk by aircraft have been sunk in harbors, Pearl Harbor and Toronto. So at this time, no battleship that was really fully defended had ever been sunk by air power. And he decides, well, you know, I could probably do without it. Probably a bad decision. Uh, so he goes heading up to Kuantan instead because he's told that there's another Japanese invasion at Kuantan. There's not. Bad information. And on his way there, he's spotted by a Japanese submarine. And the Japanese submarine radios in that, indeed, they've sighted these two big capital ships. And they call in the Japanese Nels and Bettys, these mid-range bomber torpedo planes. They do a tremendous job. Both of these ships are sunk relatively quickly uh, because Japanese torpedoes hit them, uh, Japanese bombs hit them, the, the uh, 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 Prince of Wales is hit by a, a torpedo, it does tremendous amounts of shaft damage, uh, it, it's amazing how quickly both these ships uh, go down under this onslaught of mid-range bombers. So Tom Thumb has now shown by his, I guess, rash decision that indeed the battleship is no longer the king of the seas. The king of the seas is going to now be the aircraft carrier and aircraft. Battleships certainly have still have a great role in World War II, but they are no longer uh, the main cider of power. Power is going to be gone to aircraft carriers. Well, what's interesting to me is if you look at this, so it's only the 10th of December, the Japanese have eliminated all the U.S. battleships, either sunk or damaged, and the only two British battleship and a battle cruiser in the entire Pacific by the 10th of December. So that's only a couple of days. So they're only capability left in the entire Pacific for capital ships, and I'll make aircraft carriers, I'll give them that title, is the three U.S. aircraft carriers that are still in uh, the Pacific. 
all the other ships are uh, capital ships are gone in just a couple of days. Uh, there were significant losses, uh, probably more than I would have expected because the four destroyers that were there picked up a lot of the survivors, but the casualties are still very heavy and Tom Phillips doesn't survive either. So, well, with that said, but anyway, uh, simply this is when we look at this map, again, you see the Malay Peninsula and the cry isthmus here. Um, in seven weeks, the Japanese have driven a superior number of enemy troops all the way down to the island of Singapore. So the entire Malay Peninsula in Kriathmus are under control of the Japanese in only seven weeks. Yes, Jim? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> 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 I can look it up. I mean, but look it up. Uh, but it's a lot. It's a long way. In seven weeks. It's pretty amazing, really. Well, how are they able to do this? And the issue is this. They're able to come because they've got combat veterans. They've got 200 tanks. But mostly it's the design of their militaries. One is more suitable to uh, areas with a lot of roads, with a lot of infrastructure, and one is suitable to this area, and that's because of the Japanese tactics. The Japanese also have the capability to land forces behind the British, and that causes them to evacuate. But let's look at the design of their forces quickly. We'll talk more about this when I talk about New Guinea. But the Japanese are a light infantry force. Why are they a light infantry force? They don't have the industrial capability to make a Western style really armies. Remember, they've been at war with the Chinese for over four years. And their economy is running full out as far as a war economy, well before ours does. So they just don't have, uh, you know, they can't make a million trucks. They can't make everything that they would need for a typical Western-style army. A typical Western-style army at this time is dependent on roads. It is dependent on large amounts of artillery and a lot of in logistics and infrastructure in order to move these units around. The Japanese come up with a completely different style. And part of it's based on what I talked about uh, with the uh, Imperial Way faction, where they believe that the spirit of the Japanese army will overcome Western mass technology. In other words, mass Western firepower. They, they could, they're willing to fight and die. They're willing to attack under, any, under terrible odds. That will counteract it. The other thing they realize, too, though, is they need a different way to fix this out. And that's simply this. What they're going to do is they're going to train their units to fight at night. They're also going to train their units in infiltration tactics. This is going to work fantastic in a jungle area like Malaya. Because they're going to basically slip units through the jungle. They're lightly armed. They don't need a lot of logistics. And they're going to get in behind these Indian and British troops and Australians. And they're going to create roadblocks. At this point in the war, when these units are uh, these Western style units have roadblocks, they either try to bust through that roadblock. If they don't succeed, they begin to panic. And what they will do is they will abandon their equipment and try to filter back through the jungle. This happens time and time again in uh, this area and, and other areas as well. So because they're road bound and they're trained for more of a Western style thing, they really are not the best units to be used in this kind of terrain. I remember I told you the Japanese have extremely poor logistics capability. You can see here in this picture that the Japanese actually use bicycles in order to transport their troops. So again, they're on a, basically on a shoestring budget here trying to, to do logistics against these, you know, um, Western-style units. Well, in that seven weeks, they kill or capture 50,000 of those Western troops. They started out with 70,000. 80,000. 80, they started out with 80,000. 
They, the Japanese had 70,000. So they managed to kill or capture 50,000 in seven weeks and have driven all the way down the Malay Peninsula, and now they confront the island of Singapore. Well, British still have naval capability to get in and out of Singapore, and they managed to bring an entire new division, the 18th British Division, a relatively new division, but well-armed, well-trained. And they get them in, and they managed to scrape up other forces from around the area, and they managed to bring their total force defending the island of Singapore to approximately 70,000 troops. If you look at the picture, remember, Singapore is an island, but the Johor Strait isn't really big. It's more like a river, really, than it is a, a, a ocean area. It's not like an island out in the middle of the Pacific. So it's going to be, for the Japanese to attack, it's going to be more like a river crossing. But they do blow a hole in the causeway. You can see that in the picture. It's a little hard to spot, but uh, they blow a 50-yard hole in that causeway. Well, uh, so the defense is going to be uh, a little bit, you would think, okay. But the Japanese are in a very, very difficult position, too, because they're down to 30,000 effective troops. They're at the end of their logistics train. They don't have a lot of spare artillery shells. They don't have a lot of anything left. But Yamashita, he says, you know what? Those guys are so demoralized that we can take them. And he's going to launch an attack <laughs> at really bad odds to try to take Singapore Island because he thinks that the morale of these units is so bad that he can take them down. And British do some other very strange things, I would say. Now, remember, they've had seven weeks to, to prepare this island for defense. They've decided not to do that. And the reason they do that is because the government there says, well, you know, if we start digging in, it's going to look like we're losing up in Malaya and we're not doing a very good job. And this is going to look bad to the indigenous population. And... It's going to be, if we start defending this side of the island, it's going to be bad for morale. And so they really never dig in like they could have done with seven weeks of lead time and a, and a population that would probably have assisted somewhat. So, again, you see a major, major problem with what they're doing. Well, the general in charge, who I've failed to mention, uh, is General Percival. And I think Percival, personally, uh, compared to Yamashita, is a terrible general. Well, he makes a couple of more bad assumptions. And the first bad assumption he makes is he's going to, if you look at the right side of the picture, he's going to station that new 18th division on that side of the island, thinking that that's where the Japanese are going to attack. He takes his demoralized Australian and Indian troops and puts them on the left side of the island. In fact, that is indeed where Yamashita is going to attack. So Yamashita launches this major offensive with, again, he's outnumbered. He's at the end of his supply line, but he still launches this attack, and they break through, particularly the Australians, uh, on, on this into this island. And the Japanese start to make really good gains. And if you see the circle in the middle there, there's three reservoirs. Those three reservoirs, there's an entire water supply for the port of Singapore and the Singapore residential area. When those three fall, Percival launches a desperation counterattack. It fails. At this point, Percival is so demoralized, he decides that he is going to surrender the island of Singapore. Had he waited, Yamashita is already at the end of his tether, and he has already started to make plans to withdraw from the island and go back to the Malay Peninsula. So long term, would this have made a huge difference? Probably not. But the fact is, it's certainly the British should have held out a lot longer than they do on this island. And it's, it's really a failing on Percival's part, in my opinion. And you can see here Percival coming to surrender. And Churchill refers to this as the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British history. And not only is it that, but it's shown that the imperial forces, the British, 
are not really a match for the Japanese. And this is a blow to the morale of the entire empire. So you can see that this is a disaster of, of major proportions for the, for the British. Well, what are the totals here? Pretty incredible. They lose 138,000 troops. 127,000 are captives. 38,000 British are lost, including the entire brand new 18th Division, which really never gets much into the battle. Uh, they lose 18,000 Australians, 14,000 local uh, Malay troops uh, volunteer to fight to, to hold the island. And by the way, most of those peoples are, are executed shortly after this battle. And 66,000 Indians also surrender. So it's a, it's a total disaster, but one third of these troops will die in captivity. And many of them will die building the railroad in Burma that you perhaps have seen the movie Bridge on the River Kwai. Uh, a lot of these guys are sent there. But part of the Indian force will have a different outcome. Well, this is going to cause a major, major problem between the British and the Australians. And Churchill actually sends a telegram to Prime Minister Curtin. And it references a telegram that Curtin sent to him on January 23rd. It's basically saying that they need to defend Singapore at all costs. Well, Curtin has a reply that goes, well, you know, if you're talking about my telegram on the 23rd, let's talk about your telegram on the 14th, where you were sending the 18th Division in there and on January 27th, the rest of the division was going to be there. So you're going to blame me for losing the 18th division when, in fact, you were going to send it anyway. So we start to see more and more friction between the British and the Australians at this point in the war. And it's going to be really critical soon. Well, southern resource area, right? The Malay barrier. By February 20th, the Japanese have captured the basically the entire area, except for the island of Java. So basically all their goals in this part of the world are already been achieved. Yes? Right. If you think about it, almost the entire Australian army was now in the Mediterranean in Egypt and Libya. Yes. And they were depending on the British fleet to protect their homeland. Absolutely. And so the utter anger and despair of the Australians it's completely understandable. It's totally understandable, uh, but you're going to see how this is going to play into Burma in a minute. Yes, Alan. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, they have monuments to the Anzac forces. Is this part of it? No, that that's World War One. Oh. That's Gallipoli in World War One. It has nothing so to do with this. did not fight? Oh, yes, they did, but it has nothing to do with this portion. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they're in North Africa. So anyway, um, so we see they've captured this area, and Avery, I will, I will explain this in more detail shortly. And in another lecture, I'll go into even more detail. So, but anyway, uh, we see now that there's one little problem here, and that's the port of Darwin. And on the 19th of February, there's going to be a little raid on Darwin. And... Darwin's important for two reasons. First of all, we've been using it since September of 41 to get B-17 bombers up into the Philippines. Also, Darwin is the main port that we're using to, or the Allies are using, to reinforce Java. Japanese are aware of this, and they need to do something about it. And they're going to do is they're going to send Kido Butai, four of those six carriers that were used at Pearl Harbor, to launch a major raid on this harbor. They are also going to send 36 of those medium bombers that can carry torpedoes. Instead of carrying torpedoes, they're going to carry bombs. And those are going to come in two hours later. A major, major attack on this port. Much like Pearl Harbor, radar sees a large group of aircraft coming in. And the decision is made with, well, that's just a bunch of P-40s. Coming into land. Well, it's not a bunch of P-40s. <clears throat> Two months plus into the war that you would make the same mistake at Pearl Harbor at Darwin. And indeed, they make that mistake. So the Japanese raid, they sink 
11 ships, mostly cargo ships. Three are run aground to keep them from sinking. They damage 25 other ships. They shoot down or destroy on the ground 30 aircraft for a loss of four airplanes. So it's it's a disaster. It's it's it actually, it actually makes Pearl Harbor kind of look good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Two months into the war, you would have this big of a problem. What happens next, though, is the Australian government is panicked so much so that they believe that the Japanese are going to invade Australia, and they take the civilian population of Darwin, it's not a really big population, about maybe three, 4,000 people, and they evacuate them to the interior of Australia. That's how convinced they are that the Japanese are going to land on the Australian continent at this point, this early in the war. So, indeed, to Avery's point, the Australians are incredibly concerned about what's going on right on their doorstep. So, and this is going to be the first of over 100 bombing missions the Japanese will uh, use on the Australian mainland. We never really think about Australia being bombed at this frequency, but indeed they are. So a huge, huge advantage for the Japanese at this point. Well, remember there's the island of Java is still in our hands, in ABDA's hands. We'll talk about that. And... So the Japanese are going to send an invasion force to invade Java. It's going to have two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 14 destroyers. One thing of note at this point, the difference between a heavy cruiser and a light cruiser is not the size of the cruiser. They can e be of equal size. The difference between a heavy cruiser and a light cruiser is the size of the guns on the cruiser. Light cruisers have either generally five or six inch guns. Heavy cruisers have generally eight inch guns. So that's really the difference between those two types of ship. So just for note. Well, the Allies have come up with a thing called ABDA, American, British, Dutch, Australian. And it's going to be a combined fleet of ships. And you can see the five cruisers that are part of ABDA at this point to defend Java. And that's what this and, I believe, nine destroyers are what stands between uh, Java and the Japanese. Well, you'd think that's pretty reasonable. I mean, you've got, you know, 14 destroyers and four cruisers and, you know, five cruisers and nine destroyers. That seems pretty balanced. I mean, it shouldn't be a disaster. Problem is, is the Japanese are trained together. They practiced. They're used to working with each other. These units are not. They're totally not familiar with each other. They have different uh, methods. Uh, they're, they're, they don't speak the same language. For example, Dorman, the Dutch admiral that's in charge of this group, he doesn't speak English. So everything that all his orders have to go through translators. So because these guys don't work together, they don't have the same doctrine and they don't have the same language. They're not nearly as effective as the Japanese, as you will see. Well, talked about gun power, eight-inch guns. First piece is the Japanese two heavy cruisers have a total of 28-inch guns, 10 on each ship. The British Exeter heavy cruiser only has six eight-inch guns. The USS Houston has eight eight-inch guns, but their aft turret has been hit by a bomb, and they only have six available. So quite honestly, when you look at gun power, the Japanese have a superiority of gun power of 20 to 12 big guns. But that's not the difference in this battle. The difference is going to be this thing, the Type 93 Long Lance Oxygen Torpedo. And... If you all have an extra hour or two, I could tell you about all of the, the, how fascinated I am with this particular <laughs> torpedo. But I'm going to condense this. All right. Uh, the Long Lance is an incredible weapon. Uh, it's based on the fact that the Japanese have seen oxygen tanks on a British ship in the 20s, and they think that the British are developing an oxygen torpedo. Now, why do you need an oxygen torpedo, you may ask. Well, torpedoes generally are fueled with kerosene. 
When they're underwater, they need an oxidizer. The normal thing to use for an oxidizer is air in like a thing like a scuba tank. Well, the Japanese realized that a lot of nitrogen in, in, in uh, air, and if you wanted a better, which is not useful as an oxidizer, you could get a lot more bang for your buck if you would replace that with oxygen. Oxygen's a little bit more dicey to use, uh, to put it mildly, but indeed you're going to get some incredible advantages by using oxidation, oxidation from a oxygen rather pure oxygen rather than using air and they create this torpedo it's a big torpedo i mean how big is this torpedo it's a 24 inch in diameter torpedo okay it's our u.s torpedoes at this time are 21 inches this is not the torpedo used in at, uh, pearl harbor this is not the torpedo the japanese submarines use it's big and so it, it sits on the decks of japanese ships in little turrets. They have little torpedo turrets. And there's three torpedoes in each one of these turrets. They also can reload these torpedoes fast because they have three torpedoes behind each one of these turrets. So they can, once it fires, they swing it back and then they can reload it and fire some more torpedoes. So even a Japanese destroyer has three of these turrets for a total of firepower of 18 of these giant torpedoes. They have a 1,080 pound warhead. Our biggest warhead is 827 pounds. Big warhead, big torpedo. The biggest single advantage of these torpedoes isn't this. It's their ability to have incredibly long range. This torpedo at a slower speed, which is go, it can go 50 knots, but at 38 knots, it can go 40 kilometers. That's pretty darn far underwater, okay? Our torpedo, the Mark 15, has a range of 14 kilometers. Now, they can launch this torpedo, consequently, because from a much further away than we can launch ours. Why is that a huge advantage? Because... We don't know about this torpedo. It's a secret. So when we see Japanese ships 20,000 plus yards away, the assumption is, is, well, they can't shoot torpedoes that up. They're too far away. So when the Japanese launch these spreads of torpedoes, and I mean they launch some big spreads of torpedoes, not, not unusual for them to launch between 40 and 70 torpedoes at one time, okay, that... They're so far away that we think that they can't possibly shoot in torpedoes at us. And then when they start to make hits, the Allies actually think that they're being attacked by submarines because a torpedo couldn't go that far. So it's an incredibly ad huge advantage the Japanese have early in the war with this oxygen torpedo. And I could go on for a lot longer, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> but it really is. The point is they've created a torpedo that's carried by a destroyer that can sink a battleship. And, and it, it's a, a huge advantage. Well, the battle starts. It goes on for originally for seven hours. There's a lot of artillery fire. Nobody really scores a lot of hits because uh, they're firing at extremely long range. Uh, finally, the Japanese land an 8-inch hit on the British cruiser Exeter. It hits a boiler. It slows the ship down. Once the ship slows down, it's not an effective fighting force, and Admiral Dorman orders it to retire with two of his destroyers as escorts. The Japanese finally launch a huge torpedo spread, and they sink three destroyers. Two for sure are sunk by torpedoes. One is believed Nobody knows for sure if it was sunk by a Dutch mine because there's a Dutch minefield here or it was sunk by a torpedo. So the Japanese have already eliminated. Three destroyers are sunk. The Exeter's out of the battle. Two destroyers are leaving. The, finally, the, the Allied destroyers get close enough to launch a torpedo spread. They score no hits, but they're out of torpedoes and they're running out of fuel. And Dorman says, you guys need to go back to Java, the survivors. He still has four cruisers, and he makes a really bad decision. And that decision is to fight the Japanese at night. And the Japanese are vastly superior than any other Navy at night fighting until we develop really good radar. 
But at this time in the war, they are the top notch. They practice fighting at night. And what happens is DeRoyter leads his four cruisers. The Java uh, and the DeRoyter are sunk. Dorman is killed. And two of the cruisers escape. The, the Houston and the Australian ship, the Perth. So you can see that the bulk of his ships have been destroyed at the Battle of the Java Sea. The Japanese have taken no significant losses. It's a complete disaster for ABDA. Well, there's going to be a next thing is going to be the Battle of the Sundra Strait. And uh, if you note this picture, this is really for the next slide, but it was such a great picture I put it in. That is the little U.S. four stack destroyer, the Pope being surrounded by Japanese eight-inch shells. As you can see, the Pope doesn't uh, survive this encounter. But in, it, it's just an amazing picture that the Japanese took of this thing being destroyed. So I really wanted to include it. So you'll have to bear with me on that one. Well, anyway, the Houston and the Perth are going to escape. They're going to go through the Sundra Strait, which is on the extreme western side of Java, they believe that strait is still open that the Japanese have not gotten there. Well, unfortunately, the Japanese are landing forces at Bantam Bay. And the, the Houston and the Perth run into the middle of this force. And it becomes, the best thing I can describe it is a melee. The Japanese aren't expecting them to be there. They weren't expecting to run into the Japanese, and they blunder into each other. It starts, the Japanese start firing torpedoes. Unfortunately for the Japanese, they fire torpedoes back into the bay and they sink a couple of their own troop ships. They will never admit this, but indeed that's what has happened. <laughs> so finally what happens is the Japanese overwhelm these two cruisers. Uh, the Perth, for example, takes four hits from long lances. It goes down quite quickly. The Houston, same issue. The long lance gets it as well. So there's 1,061 men have been on board the Houston, 368 are rescued, and 77 die in captivity of the Japanese. You can see there's 681 crewmen on the Perth, and only 218 of them survive the war. So it's a disaster. But what happens to the other cruisers, the Exeter? The Exeter is captured, is the Japanese cruisers catch up with it. It's moving slowly because of damage to its boilers. And it's destroyed uh, by uh, Japanese cruisers, along with the two escorting destroyers, the Encounter and the Pope. So, basically, we see by the end of this that the entire ABDA cruisers, all of them are gone. Uh, the bulk of their destroyers are gone. I believe it was seven out of nine uh, are, are sunk. So... This, now the Japanese are free to invade Java with absolutely no uh, allied naval forces in their way. Well, just briefly to talk about Java, the Japanese land on Java, and what happens is, is that many of the Indonesian people welcome them because they're so unhappy about Dutch rule that they, again, assist the invading Japanese in this whole idea of Pan-Asianism and once again to create the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. So again, they aid the Japanese, they hate the Dutch. It doesn't work out so well for them by the time 1944 and 45 comes around, but indeed at this stage of the war they're, they're very much into anti-imperialism. Well, That'll bring us into the invasion of Burma. So Burma actually at this time was part of India up until 1935. It's part of the British Empire. And they've created a separate Burmese state in 1935. So there is a significant amount of Burmese that are into independence. They want to be an independent country. And they don't like Indians, particularly a group, an indigenous group called the Bamar. The Bamar really, really hate Indians. They think Indians are moneylenders. They're a threat to the economy. Uh, they just don't want them in, in, in Burma. They want them out. So the Bamar, once again, are reached out by that F. Kikan group, which I talked about, the Japanese intelligence group, and they get a lot of support 
from the Japanese to build their idea that it's going to be Burma for the Burmese. And so that's they're going to get a lot of help again, uh, getting rid of this, again, the yoke of colonialism, put it that way. Well, the British have not a lot of forces in, in Burma. They have an Indian 17th Division, which suffers, again, the same issues with all Indian divisions. They're really not trained, and they're really not great morale. They have a lot of the same problems we've seen in Malaya. They also have a thing called the 1st Burma Division, which is actually a different ethnic group is primarily used for that, not the Bamar. And, but it's really not an infantry division. It's really more like a, a security force, a police force, a border guards. So they don't have a lot of heavy weapons. They're not really capable of fighting the Japanese. Um, but the Chinese are willing to help as well. Because the Chinese are up in the north, particularly the northeast, and they want to keep that Burma road open because that's their only supply line now that they have at all to Western weapons. There's no other way to get into, Bur uh, into China except through Rangoon taking the Burma road. So they desperately want to keep that road open. So the Chinese are going to throw everything they have to try to protect this area as well. Well, the Japanese are going to seize Burma for a couple of reasons. Of course, the first one, of course, they want to cut that road. They want to end the war in China. The other thing is that there's a lot of food there. It's a, it's a food exporting country. There's oil in Burma. There's a lot of, of really good resources that the Japanese can get out of Burma. So they really have a strong desire to capture this and plan to do it from day one. Well, they're going to attack from Thailand. The Thais, Siam, they have signed a treaty with the Japanese already. So by the 14th of December, the Japanese are already on the border of Burma and beginning to make incursions. By the 18th of December, they've already hit an airfield. And that airfield is important because that's where the American volunteer group is, the Flying Tigers. So the Flying Tigers, many people believe, were fighting previously to Pearl Harbor. They were not. But they are fighting primarily at this time in uh, over Thailand and over Burma. So you see the AVG is actually forced at this early on into evacuating one of their major bases because of Japanese incursions already into Burma. Very, very quick that you see them making these incursions. Well, the same old story over and over and over again in this lecture, and I apologize, but I can't stress enough how the Japanese infiltration tactics continually destroy Indian and British and Australian units. So what happens here is, is that the Indians, once again, the Japanese infiltrate, they get behind them, they cause a roadblock, and they abandon all their equipment and, and filter back through the jungle. Then, of course, they're disaster, another disaster, and they have to be reorganized, and they're much less effective fighting force. Well, one of the most dis biggest disasters is the Sitang Bridge disaster. So the Indian Division has two brigades on the north side, the, the top picture, right, on one side of the river, holding this bridge. One brigade has already gone to the bottom half. The Japanese begin to infiltrate in closer and closer to this bridge, and the decision is made. They haven't captured the bridge, but the decision is made by the British commander of this division to blow the bridge, even though he has two brigades on the other side. So now these two brigades are completely trapped. So, of course, they're going to lose all their equipment. Many are going to surrender. But some of them, rather, every boat they can get, some of them actually swim the river in order to get away from the Japanese. It's a tremendous, tremendous disaster, and it completely destroys the morale of that British division, or Indian division, excuse me. So their morale is completely shot. Well, after this disaster, there's not a lot of capability to defend Rangoon, which is the key here. That's what... what they need to hold Rangoon. That's the big port. So they're going to 
try to get more troops in. So the British send some reinforcements, but they reach out to the Australians. The Australians have three divisions fighting in North Africa. The Australians demand that those three divisions be returned to defend Australia. The British cut a deal, and we'll talk about that more when we get to New Guinea, but they cut a deal with the United States, but one of those divisions is sent back immediately. The British basically begged them to please let us have that division to defend Rangoon. And it's a, it's a well-trained combat veteran unit that's been fighting the Germans. It would, I'm sure, have been a thorn in, in, if it didn't hold Rangoon, it certainly would have been a problem for the Japanese if that division comes. The Australians say, absolutely not. That division's coming back to Australia. It's not going to defend Rangoon. And indeed, that's what happens. At this point, the general in charge at Rangoon is Alexander. Alexander says, without more troops, I can't hold Rangoon. And what he's going to do is he's going to try to escape to the northwest to get into India. Problem. Once again, a Japanese unit has blocked the road. Alexander launches an attack on this unit. It fails. This is their only way out. And he makes the decision that he's going to launch an all-out attack on that unit. If that fails, he's going to have to surrender like Singapore. Interesting. The Japanese unit that holds this roadblock is under orders to only hold it temporarily. Japanese troops throughout World War II, their mid-level officers, follow orders regardless. They don't have a lot of individual initiative unlike perhaps the Germans, which have a ton of individual initiative. So this unit basically says, okay, I, I'm holding this blocking point, but guess what? I was ordered to leave it. I don't think it's a good idea to leave it, but those are orders, and indeed, they do. They abandon this roadblock. The British launch their attack, and there's no Japanese. And so indeed, that starts an incredibly long difficult, terrible withdrawal all the way from Rangoon into India. And it, it's really a, a, another absolute disaster. Well, what happens there is they escape overland. They do the best they can. But the Chinese have also put in as much troops as they can. But the Chinese, you have to think about this. The Chinese have been at war for four and a half years. They've had terrible losses, particularly I talked about them losing uh, officers to rebuild their armies. They have had terrible ability to resupply. They don't really have the indigenous capability to make weapons. So they're always dependent on other people. Well, they're, they're not getting that much. So these units, even though they're willing to fight, are not really as capable as they should be. So now the Chinese are forced to withdraw as well. But also what's going on is there's a tremendous amount of civilians. Remember, there's Indians there, and the Bamar don't like the Indians, so they're all trying to get out of Dodge. Of course, there are British and other uh, colonial powers that are stationed there and have civilians there, and they're all trying to get out of Burma and get into India. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of loss of life of these people. So British finally escape. But the escape is, is a disaster. Again, they lose 2,000 trucks, 110 tanks, 40 guns, 30,000 killed or captured. Chinese lose an estimate of 40,000 men trying to defend Burma. But perhaps the most ugly thing about this whole thing is the civilians. Civilians are literally trying to walk out of this area through the jungle. They're on jungle trails. They're, they're starving to death. And the losses of these 500,000 people that are trying to evacuate, the estimates go anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 die trying to escape Japanese rule in uh, Burma. It, it's, it's a tremendous humanitarian disaster. The Japanese claim they only lose 5,000 men. I would debate that. Japanese generally uh, 
don't aren't real forthcoming with their actual losses, but indeed that's what the claim is. Only 5,000 men are lost. So another huge disaster in Asia by the uh, uh, British and by caused by the Japanese. So when we look at this, and we see, as far as today's lecture go, everything has been captured. We'll talk about the Philippines next week. But the Japanese have captured the entire southern resource area. They have used the goal of Pan-Asianism and the goal of a greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere to help them achieve these goals. So we can see that Asia is responding in many ways, a lot of Asians, not all Asians, but a lot of Asians are responding to this thought process to get rid of colonialism. What we will see though, is what I briefly mentioned was that the British captives, these Indian captives that were fighting for the British, those Indian expatriates in Malaya that want the British gone, they are going to create their own army. They're going to create a Japanese-led, Japanese-controlled, uh, in effect, Indian army that will try to free India from British rule. By 1943, they will have created that army of 43,000 men, and indeed, that will be basically armed with British captured equipment. So we'll talk more about them in a future lecture. So thank you all for coming today, and uh, we'll take up the Philippines next week. So thank, thank you. you. Well done.